Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 22nd, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we believe the spring revenue forecast misleads Alaskans on an important issue. Second, we discuss the Alaska House Coalition's proposal to layer on yet another regressive tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. And third, yet another legislator proposes an ineffective spending cap placebo. And now, let's join Michael. We're going to dive into today's uh, in today's weekly top three, and uh, we got some good stuff. I think this is going to be an interesting discussion. Uh, the spring forecast has come out, and of course, you and I have talked about the dangers of as things come and go and wax and wane. Of course, the one thing that politicians love to see is the fortunes and tides of the state turn around in the other direction, like all of a sudden, oh, we're going to get more money. Uh, prices are going up or production's going to go up and we really don't have to face the elephant in the room which of course is our spending habit and so now they've got the new spring forecast and you're going to give us a little bit of a more realistic analysis of what's coming out of that let's dive into it well last week we saw headlines in the in the press about uh, uh revenue uh, the department of revenue forecasts more revenue and the but and the deficit isn't as bad as we thought it was now there's there's two things that I think we ought to focus on. One is the deficit, the deficit isn't as bad under the spring revenue forecast as we thought it was, but there's still a deficit uh, in both uh, FY21, the current year, FY22, uh, uh, the budget that the legislature is working on now, uh, and FY23, even under the spring forecast, uh, there's uh, there's still, uh, still a deficit. So, you know, saying that the deficit isn't, it isn't as bad as we thought it was. It's sort of like, you know, I, I stopped beating my head on the wall 20 times a minute. I cut it down to 10 times a minute. Right. Uh, there's still a headache. It may not be a severe headache. But here's here's the second and the much more, I think, important thing uh, uh, about the spring revenue forecast that I find uh, problematic. The spring revenue forecast uh, forecast that prices would continue rising out through the remainder of the decade, uh, production uh, was going to go up out through the remainder of the decade. And if you look, if you extend out the spring forecast out to um, uh, 2027, 2028, 2029, uh, all of a sudden the deficit disappears. Um, and and it, 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 based on Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, proposed spending levels, the, the deficit des- disappears. The problem with that, the serious problem with that, is it's based on oil prices that are not reflective of what the futures market uh, or any other uh, uh, model uh, is uh, is projecting. Uh, the 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 futures market tells us that that prices aren't going up. Prices, in fact, are going to go back down. That what's happening currently is we have an artificial uh, supply shortage. Uh, resulting from OPEC withholding volumes from the market and uh, uh, investment in shale uh, being uh, at a relatively uh, at a relative low, uh, what uh, what the market is taking into account is that eventually, because of fiscal constraints on the OPEC nations and other things, uh, that OPEC will come back into the market, will bring those volumes back into the market, 
uh, and that uh, at, at around $60, shale starts showing up again. Um, uh, investment in shale starts going, showing up again, and, and, and shale volumes uh, uh, come back on the market. And so what, what, the, what the futures market is telling us is, is the current price levels that we're seeing right now are sort of the peak, uh, and, and we're going we're gonna to trend back down from there. Uh, the other thing about uh, the, the revenue forecast is, is the revenue forecast is showing increased volumes, substantial increased volumes, out toward the end of the decade. Um, but that's based upon things like Willow being successful and Pika being successful. We hope they are, but it's, it's premature. I mean, neither of those have gone to final investment decision. Neither of those uh, are commitments by the companies to proceed forward with, uh, with the projects. And there's, as we've talked on the show before, there's some substantial uh, uh, funding issues around the Pika project. Um, and so, what, what the what the what the revenue forecast is really saying is is there's a range uh, of outcomes, and we're going to pick the very best and show and show uh, show this future. If you if you revise uh, the the forecast to insert. Uh, the the prices, the forward prices that the market's showing us, deficits not only don't get better uh, in terms of in terms of, of going away, the deficits get worse because prices are uh, are coming back down below. Our prices continue to stay below uh, the forecast level, even in the the the, the forecast, even in the fall forecast, uh, which is where uh, where the deficit projections uh, uh, originally came from. Here's the problem with, with that we that we've worked ourselves into with 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 these forecasts. We've run out of savings. So now instead of saying, well, we'll sort of project the future and and maybe we're right, maybe we're wrong, but we've always got savings to back us up if we're wrong. Now we don't have savings. And so these projections have become hugely important in terms of giving us an indication about where we're headed and as a result what we need to be doing about uh, about budget levels. Uh, the the legislature has said, has repeatedly had testimony in front of it saying, any revenue measures uh, you enact this year, it's going to take at least two years uh, to for them to be uh, for them to be producing revenue. And if we're now telling ourselves that we don't need to worry about those anymore, because the forecast is telling us the revenue forecast is telling us that we're going to be we're going to be in good shape. Uh, when we get there, uh, and and it turns out the revenue forecast was too optimistic, and we're and we're going to, you know, experience a a future that's much more like what the futures market is telling us. Uh, when we get there, we're we're, we're going to be out of savings. Uh, we're not going to have enacted uh, the substitute uh, revenue measures that uh, that we've talked on the show uh, talked about on the show before. And as a consequence, when we get there. We're just going to keep doing PFD cuts. We will have not prepared for the future that is that is that is coming. We won't have savings to back us up, and so the the knee jerk reaction, the continued reaction the legislature is going to have, uh, is to is to take these PFD cuts. It, it is the the revenue forecast has become much much more important uh, because we're out of savings. It's become much much more important uh, than it was in the past, and I think. Uh, uh, that, uh, that that we've got we've got a revenue department. I mean, if this was we, when the Walker administration did this, we accused them of rigging the numbers, right? Um, I'm I'm not sure I'm ready to pre I'm prepared to accuse the Dunleavy no administration of rigging the numbers, but they are uh, uh, showing a a revenue future. Uh, that is much much different, I think, than uh, than, than certainly what the what, what the market um, is showing us. There's one other thing that really that sort of bothers me about this. The spring forecast usually is used to to revise the fall forecast for the current year and maybe the next fiscal year and maybe a little bit the fiscal year beyond. But usually, what the revenue forecast does is just replace the near term numbers and leave the long term numbers. That were in the fall revenue forecast in place. The reason they do that is because there's a lot deeper, longer, more intense process that goes into the fall revenue forecast that goes into the into the spring revenue forecast. What the administration did this time with the spring forecast is replace 
not only the near-term numbers, they replaced all the numbers uh, uh, going out to the end of the, of the forecast period, to, to 2030, both the, the, the price numbers and the volume numbers. Right. Um, w- when they've done that in the past, when they've replaced the price numbers, they've done it based upon what the market is telling you the numbers are going to be. And so this time, not only did they, did they deviate from past practice in terms of, going, of replacing the, the price strip all the way out to the end of the decade, but they deviated from past practice in terms of replacing it with numbers that don't reflect what the market's telling us uh, at the time they did it. Well, Brad, isn't this a problem that we've had in this state for years? I mean, again, going back to basing past budgets on uh, revenue projections and some of these other things. Again, I, I, I keep going back to it, but that time when Sean Parnell created a state budget based on 117 barrel a dollar oil because that's what it was at the very beginning of the process but by the time they were getting through the process oil had dropped down below eighty dollars a barrel and i mean it was it was all fiction it was all pie in the sky it was all you know it's like they they hope for the they they plan for the best and and if the worst is going to come they don't even think about the worst it's like we're going to do everything on the best case scenario and it just never works out yeah, well, and 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 again, the point is, during the twenty teens, we had savings yeah. that would that, that was sort of sitting out there and said, "Well, if you if you miss it, uh, we, we'll just go tap savings." We don't have that. I mean, the savings right, the savings we have going forward, the quote savings we have going forward, is either is either PFD cuts or excess uh, 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 ERA draws, which is essentially a tax on future generations. So. You know the savings we have going forward is are taxes. Um, uh, that's what that's what that's what we're drawing on. In the in the twenty teens, yeah, it, it was it was bad when when they when they rigged the the revenue forecast. But again, we had savings to bail us out. We don't have that anymore. And and so the revenue forecasts are a lot more important and need to be a lot more honest, uh, frankly, uh, than they've been in the past. Well, and again, I think this goes back to you can't keep hiding it. You can't keep saying, oh, it's all going to work out. Rosy and every, again, my my mantra has always been prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And it seems like the legislature and the administration's uh, uh, desire is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, you can't hide, you know, uh, deficits that are already going out year after year for the next decade, and say that nothing is wrong. I mean, it's like everyone in the in the room is refusing to acknowledge that what we have is a spending problem instead of a revenue problem. They keep pointing at all the revenues and saying, oh, look, we could fix it with this revenue. Oh, we could fix it with that revenue. Oh, we could fix it with this revenue. If you would just contain the spending, you would go a long way to fixing this pain. Yeah, I'm, my, my, I agree. Uh, my, my real concern is they're going to sit there, this legislature, and they're going to say, oh, the revenue forecast tells us that, yes, we've got a rough patch the next couple of years, but if we make these adjustments that – that the governor has recommended, uh, uh, we're going to be we're going to be fine. The, we're not, and and the failure to act, the failure to, to respond to what the market's telling us uh, the future is going to be, the failure to act is just going to lead to a situation in which we continue to to to, to make deep P- PFD cuts or uh, uh, ERA overdraws, and yep. and it's and and, and and that's that's we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, and, uh, and and we should be we should be facing up to the truth, uh, and uh, and 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 developing a fiscal policy that responds to the truth as opposed to, frankly, this fiction that uh, that's in the fall revenue for, or in the spring revenue. For. Well, it's fiction. It's not even a bestseller, unfortunately, and it happens every year, twice a year, usually here in the state of Alaska. Number two is a new set of taxes that the Democrats in the legislature are talking about. Give us a tease for this, Brad, so that we can come back to it here in the next segment. So Luke Hopkins and others have proposed an increase in the gasoline tax, uh, doubling uh, the the state gasoline tax. Uh, They are right in the sense that the gasoline tax hasn't been changed for a long time. But there's a problem with with, with with, with using the gasoline tax to raise revenue, and that is... It's a regre- It's another regressive tax. It falls hardest on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. has a, has a, 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 a small effect uh, on uh, on high income Alaska families. So we're 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 going down the road of layering yet another regressive tax on uh, on middle and lower income Alaska families. And, I, and and that's just that's the wrong direction to be going. Continuing now, Brad Keithley, the weekly top three Alaskans for sustainable budgets. 
We're on to number two. We're talking about the new form of taxation. In this instance, a gas tax being proposed by Greyer Hopkins and a company there in the uh, uh, Alaska House. Brad's going to give us some analysis of that and uh, talk about some of the problems with it. Let's go over here and continue with Brad. Uh, number two, Brad, looks like it's uh, it looks like it's ugly. Well, here's here's the here's the problem with 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 the gasoline tax. It it is. I, I mean, I've talked. Uh, if we're not going to cut spending, I've talked about the need for additional revenue, um, substitute revenue. And here's here's a proposal for substitute revenue. But the problem with it is it just it it doubles up on the bad bad things that we've got going on now. We have PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on on Alaska families and on uh, the Alaska economy of of all of the options. The reason why that is is they hit middle and lower income Alaska families hardest. They leave the top 20% relatively almost entirely unscathed and don't don't have any revenue contribution coming from uh, uh non-residents. Uh the a, a a gasoline tax just layers on top of that. A gasoline tax like a sales tax like PFD cuts is regressive. It hits middle and lower income Alaska families as a percent of income harder uh, than it hits the top 20%. If you look at a at a diagram, the percent of income being taken from uh, middle and lower income Alaska families is a lot through gasoline tax is a lot higher than uh, than from the top 20%. So we're just we're just increasing the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. We're increasing the burden on the overall Alaska economy uh, uh, even more. Uh, and and it's not kind of 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 to revenues or revenue reform that we need. We need to level the playing field. We need to get all Alaskans engaged. If we're going to have revenues, we need to have all Alaskans contributing about the same amount as a percent of income uh, toward uh, uh, toward the uh, toward the solution to, to to be fair, not only to be equitable to Alaska families, but also to lower the adverse impact uh, of of that revenue measure on uh, the overall Alaska economy. And here the Democrats who say that they're most concerned about middle and lower income uh, families, who say that they're you know, looking out for the common man, for the working man, the Democrats are the very ones who are proposing yet another regressive tax to layer on top of the regressive tax that we've already got uh, through PFD cuts. We need, as we've talked about on the show, as I've talked about on the show, if we're not going to cut spending, we need uh, substitute revenues, but we need substitute revenues that are fair, overall fair. Maybe as part of an overall package that leveled the playing field, uh, uh, had all Alaskans having, all Alaska families having skin, same skin in the game. Maybe as part of an overall package, uh, 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 an increase in the gas la- gasoline tax might might make some sense. If you give people their PFDs back. They can better afford. I mean, Governor Hammond said this: if you give people their PFD back, PF, PFDs back, they can better afford uh, some increase uh, in in tax. But to take a middle and lower income Alaska families PFD to take their income uh, by PFD cuts and then layer on top of that a tax, uh, an additional tax that hits them hardest, uh, I think is just is just going in the wrong direction. And I'm just shocked, shocked. That that no tr- uh, truly I mean you're going to chuckle at this but I'm shocked <laughs> the Democrats who who say that they're looking out for middle and lower income Alaska families that the Democrats are the one that are that are pushing forward on on this sort of approach. Well, and look, uh, the article that covers this is in the Fairbanks Daily News Miner, and and what I'm shocked about uh, I mean as well is the fact that there is just this lazy attitude about it because the way it's being sold and it's being sold in this article, it's being sold as Oh, hey, if we do this, the gas tax would raise $33 million per year to help maintain roads and highways and infrastructure. Hopkins is selling it as a reason why we've got two different bridges in Fairbanks that were shut down. Wendell and University are shut down for deferred maintenance repaired and the Dalton Highway and all this kind of stuff. And this is what we needed for. But what is never brought up in this article is that there are no, again, 
There are no dedicated funds. They, you cannot take a tax and say, oh, it's going to be for this, it's going to be for that. It all ends up being UGF spending in the end, uh, unless, of course, they try to designate it out for something else. But that's how they continue to sell it. Oh, we'll use it for something else. We promise. This is the same thing that happens in communities when they say, we're going to hike this tax and we'll spend it on schools. But normally it goes into, again, into a general fund and can be used for anything. But that is the sales pitch. And it's just, it's so infuriating. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier during the break, which is my fear is any new tax is going to create just more money for them to be able to spend because they have not addressed the main issue, which is they have a spending problem. Well, and, and, and to be honest, this, I mean, one of the reasons Grier is proposing this is because it helps out uh, 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 road contractors, bridge contractors, uh, and employees. It's, 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 to, to some degree, there's a union issue going on in here also. But, 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 the, but the, 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 the irony of this is it's hitting the, the same income brackets that are already being hit uh, heavily by PFD cuts, and there's no there's no recognition of that uh, in the in the Fairbanks newspaper article. There's no there's no issue. There's no recognition that who pays this tax is going to be exact by and large exactly the same people that are already being hit uh, by PFD cuts. It's all about it's always all about who, how can we spend this money? How can we you know how can we you, know, you distribute the benefits of it? And, 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 and we are very bad in this state about analyzing who's paying uh, that money uh, uh, to produce, uh, pr- produce those benefits. So it's, I mean, it, our, the, the question I have is, are we concerned about the overall Alaska economy? Are we concerned about Alaska families? If we are, we need to stop piling the, the revenue responsibility on middle and lower income Alaska families, because that is the, the step that has the largest adverse impact on both families and all in the overall Alaska economy. Basically, the answer you get back is, eh, you, know, you know, we're sort of concerned about the overall economy, but, you know, these contractors, we need to build bridges, and, and these employees, they need to be able to work on construction projects. So, yeah, yeah, I'm sort of concerned about the overall impact, but I, I really want to help. I, what right. I really want to do is help out this segment most. Right. Well, and there's a secondary part problem to this as well. This is one of those things where the government creates the problem so that they can then create a solution to the problem. Hopkins noted in this article that the overdue repairs on the Wendell and University Avenue bridges would not be as intense as capital projects if there were adequate funds for upkeep along Along the way, again, these were deferred repairs. The money was there. They spent the money on something else. I mean, that's that's the danger of deferred. the 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 Fairbanks North Star Borough has a quarter of a billion dollars in deferred maintenance. The money was there. They just decided to spend it on something else. Again, going right back to a spending problem. Yeah, we, we the, the the sum and substance of this is we if we're going to have a revenue solution we need an overall revenue solution that that takes into account who's being hit who's 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 paying uh, the revenue these these nickel and dime uh, oh let's just have more revenue here more revenue there more revenue there these nickel and dime approaches are just piling the burden more and more on middle and lower income Alaska families increasing the adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy more and more. Instead of these nickel and dime revenue yep. approaches, okay. we need to have an overall approach. Robbie says, talk about Hoffman and Olson. Hoffman almost had a heart attack the first day Donna showed up and said all money is green. And Olson came out of his chair when confronted with the idea he would have to share with his neighbors. Uh, I mean, that's – and I agree. Uh, I mean, we've created these little fiefdoms inside the government – where we can insulate and isolate money that should be used for, I mean, if the, if the dividend's fair game for all appropriation, then pretty much all money should be fair game for all appropriation. And uh, we shouldn't be siloing money out there. And in fact, the Constitution kind of forbids it, but they've been working their way around it with, again, the sweep and the reverse sweep. Uh, that's really going to be one of the major tools in our arsenal this go around, right, Brad? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's funny when, uh, when you hear... People talk about uh, uh, the the PCE and others being, you know, designated funds. You can't touch those; they're designated funds. All designated funds means is it's it's established by statute. 
as opposed to constitution, it's established by statute that, that certain monies will be used for certain things. The, the, the hilarious part of this is the PFD is designated by statute. Uh, yet in 2017, uh, 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 Anna uh, and uh, Anna Fairclaw or uh, McKinnon um, uh, and, uh, and other co-chairs of House and Senate Finance redesignated it uh, as UGF, as, as unrestricted general funds. Uh, and it's always humorous to me when, uh, when, you know, you start talking about PCE or you talking about, talk about the community support fund or, or any of the other funds, you start talking about, you know, moving those other, over to general funds and using them to, to fund other things, um, uh, that, you know, the legislators go crazy because that's their, as you said, that's their personal fiefdoms. But, when you talk about you know doing exactly the same thing, redesignating uh, uh, the PFD, which is a designated general fund, redesignating that to UGF, they, you know everybody just sort of goes, "Well, that's what we have to do." It's uh, it, the the hypocrisy around these designations is uh, is is thick, uh, and it is. I mean, people play those games when it's their fund uh, that's uh, that's at risk. Sort of the problem. The problem we have, I guess, is that uh, nobody nobody considers the PFD their personal uh, fund that they that they need to look out for. Uh, Natasha views it as a uh, as a, a, a pot of money that she can go after to avoid uh, uh, raising other revenues. Uh, uh, others in the legislature view it the same. And uh, and there's and there's no one who at least sits on Senate Finance or House Finance that says no wait you know this is my fund. halliman has got PCE, Donnie's got community community assistance, uh, but the PFD is my fund, and and there's no one in 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 a position of power who uh, who sort of looks at it uh, looks at it in the same fashion. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, let me go back over here and see what else we have going on uh, in the chat room here. Uh, it's um, it's possible to see a lot of jobs leaving this country once again as the taxes continue to increase as the government control the big jobs will go elsewhere. Well, I mean, we just had the announcement today that GCI just moved 147 jobs overseas to a Filipino uh, call center now. Uh, so uh, 54 people out of those 147 are going to lose their jobs. And uh, so, yeah, we could see that. If there is a tax on top of that, more taxes on top of that, I'm sure you'll see other companies that will decide to make that move as well. But, Michael, we have taxes. I mean, the, the, the thing we need to keep in mind is we have taxes. PFD cuts are taxes. Sure. And they fall, they fall hardest on middle- and lower-income Alaska families. The question is whether we want to continue that tax approach uh, that's regressive and falls hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families, or we want a more equitable uh, uh, tax approach. You, you you can't you you can't have it both ways. Right. As long as, long as you don't as, as long as you don't cut government spending, you can't have it both ways. We are going to have taxes. The question is who's who is going to fall on. Well, I mean, and that's that's one hundred percent true. And I guess I was talking about additional taxes more than what we have right now. Uh, and, and of course, this all problem all stems back to the fact that what we have in this state, and I've said it for years. It is not a revenue problem, but a spending problem. And again, where you and I differ on this, especially on the, on the talk of, of other taxation, is my fear is that, that they will continue to spend it. No matter what, you know, if they generate new revenue in one way or the other, even if it's a different form of revenue, they will still continue to spend it because, as you've seen with the spring revenue forecast outlook and the way they're reacting, they just they, they, they can't see any other path in front of them. I got 20 seconds, Brad. Well, the, uh, any 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 new revenue has to come with 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 constitutionalizing the PFD and has to come with a spending cap. I mean, that's the way yep. you protect against substitute revenues being used as as incremental additional revenues. Uh, right. that, that's that's a, that's a requisite. All right, let's move on to number three, which we talked about a bit yesterday, uh, which is of course uh, the spending cap. Uh, and the problem is we've had three spending caps proposed now. And the problem with each and every one of them is the same problem with the current spending cap that's in our Constitution, which is that it's a spending cap based on uh, expenditures instead of based on revenue. And I kind of uh, I sussed this out and broke this back down into kind of a, a homespun 
uh, uh, understandable version of you know household budget and everything else. But give us your thoughts on the spending caps and and what's wrong with what we're seeing right now. Well, my the, the focus of this segment is on the spending cap that just got introduced yesterday by Ivy Sponholtz. The reason it's important is because Ivy is going to be chair of the Ways and Means Committee, uh, and she sold this as she is selling this as one way. Uh, of addressing of addressing the the state's fiscal problem that's going to be addressed in in uh, in, in ways and means. The the when you look at it, I mean, the title of the release from the House Coalition is "Lawmaker Introduces Innovative Bill to Limit State Spending." Well, when you look at it, it's not that much different from the governor's uh, proposed uh, uh, spending cap, which is based upon an average of of three year prior three year spending levels adjusted for inflation uh, or uh, and or population growth. Ivy's is basically the same, uh, so it's not very innovative. It's just it's sort of mimicking what the governor's doing, uh, but but it is the same. It has the same problem as you just outlined, as the as we've discussed on the program before, with other spending caps. It is it is detached from reality. I mean, we, we it the juxtaposition between this se- segment of our of our discussion focused on spending cap, spending cap based upon prior spending levels, and the first segment talking about revenue, the revenue forecast, and how oil prices, the market selling as oil prices are going down, uh, instead of this ever increasing uh, 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 thing that's in, that's included in the spring revenue forecast. I mean, so 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 we're setting up a spending level focused on prior. Foc- or spending cap focused on prior spending levels that will continue to go up, adjusted by inflation and uh, 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 population growth. But revenues, look back at the first segment. Look, look at the what what the market is telling us about revenues. Revenues are going down. That, that's that's a recipe for you know nothing. I mean, you're not you're not right, capping. Right. You're not you're not solving the problem. Ivy's bill is like the governor's, and then you've got Natasha's bill and everything else, and every one of them has the same fatal flaw, which is they're basing it on uh, expenditures. And and I mean, why? I don't know. I mean, this is exactly the same problem as I said that we have in the constitutional bill uh, or the constitutional cap is that you know we just we keep outpacing it. That that a that a, a spending cap, uh, any kind of spending cap or spending plan, is is has to be based on the money that you take in. It can't be based on what you want to spend. Yeah, exactly right, Michael. I mean, it's just it it is it's a placebo. You, you, we all know what a placebo is in the medical sense, right? It's something that the doctor gives you that has no medical impact, but it, but it makes you feel better because because you're taking you're taking a medicine. Well, that's what these spending caps are. It's a placebo. It's 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 there to tell you that oh, we got a spending cap now. We're okay, uh, but it has no it has no real impact. I mean, it's sending spending off. It's sending the the cap sends spending off in a, at a at a different trajectory uh, than than what revenues are are projected to do. Uh, so it's just it's something to tell Alaskans. I mean, I I've come to the conclusion. That is sort of, that is just they're being introduced to be able to tell Alaskans we're doing something about it. We hear <laughs> we hear what you're saying. <laughs> we're going to have a spending cap, but it's but but they're ineffective and 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 it's just the same thing as the doctor giving you a sugar pill. It's not going to it's not going to cure you. You may think you're being cured, uh, but it's not going to cure you. Well, but this goes back to that question of you know would the, the you know to do the lunatics really want somebody else running the asylum? I mean, do they want to tie their hands? And of course, they don't want to tie their hands. Legislators do not want to tie their hands, uh, keep themselves away from these pots of money. They want to be able to spend. They believe that they know better than us how this money should be spent, and 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 that's what this all comes down to. This would, if it was a true spending cap based on revenues. It would tie their hands and reduce their ability to expend funds. It would fix the problem, but that—that's—that's that's the thing. They don't want to fix the problem. Yeah, that, we're saying the same thing. They, they want to say they're fixing the problem. They want—they want to give you a sugar pill and say you're going to feel better. Uh, but you're right. They don't want to—they don't want to apply the medicine uh, that it takes to uh, to actually cure uh, the illness. And it's just—I mean. Ivy's going to hold hearings on this. There's going to be a big deal about, you know, we're solving the problem. Democrats are solving the problem. Look at us. We've got this innovative, innovative plan. It just solves nothing. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't address the fundamental issue 
uh, that we're facing at the state. And it puts off, I mean, it sucks oxygen out of the room that we need to be using to address the, to address the real problem. Do right. we either want to cut, cut spending or, uh, or uh, do we are we are we prepared to uh, to develop replacement revenues to you know have a more equitable revenue approach? Well, this all becomes virtue signaling. Whether it's Ivy Sponholtz or the governor or Natasha, it's all virtue signaling to say, look, I'm I'm doing what I said I was going to do. I'm putting a spending cap. We're going to put rails on this, and it's going to work. We guarantee it's going to work. But we know that obviously it's not. Brad Keithley, um, any final thoughts here before I let you go? We got about a minute. Well, Michael, my, my, my final thought is this legislature uh, is, is, is diluting itself if it thinks uh, uh, there's increased revenues that are, that are coming out there that we don't really have a problem that we can kick this can down the road uh, again. That's not what the market's telling us. This legislature needs to be honest. We, had, we elected people who said they were going to be honest uh, and transparent and, and forthright. Uh, they need to live up to that, and we need to uh, we need to come up with a total fiscal package out of this legislature, as opposed to uh, pieces that uh, that make it worse. All right, Brad Keithley, thank you so much, my friend. It's good to talk with you as always. We appreciate you coming on board, Michael. As always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.